Welcome to Swallow the Gap, the podcast that delves into the critical world of dysphagia practice and education. I'm your host, Dr. Tim Stockdale, and I'm thrilled to have you join us for conversations aiming to bridge gaps in understanding, knowledge, and implementation surrounding dysphagia intervention. We will be a force for change by inspiring critical thinking, facilitating discussion, and promoting professional development. Swallow the Gap is here to discuss, inform, inspire, and connect you with a vibrant community who is dedicated to making positive change. Together, we'll unpack challenges and be open about our own struggles and work to bridge gaps in our field that impact the lives of those living with swallowing difficulties. Our opinions should not be taken to represent our employers or the groups with whom we associate. Nothing we say is legal advice and nothing should be taken without scrutiny. While we strive for accuracy, we do not imply perfection. We value diversity in backgrounds and opinions, so our guests will not always reflect what we believe. In fact, we may change our minds on topics as we learn because this is how progress is made. Through discussion, critical thinking, and open minds, we serve as catalysts for advancement in medically focused speech language pathology. Good morning, everybody. I'm back on my old stomping grounds, just in a new building with a couple of people I know and a former student. We have Dr. Phil Sectum, soon to be doctor and should be called doctor anyway, Wendy Chase, and Russell, also soon to be doctor de Jesus. How's it going, Russell? Pretty good. I don't know how soon that is, but... (laughs) Yeah? (laughs) You may make it before me, Russell, given uh, the pace of my dissertation lately, so (laughs) we could have a race to the final. There you go. Oh, Russell, what are you, where are you at and what are you doing? So uh, I'm living in Salt Lake right now. I'm at the University of Utah. Um, I am studying something called repetition reduction. Uh, this is my second semester, so I don't know what that means. Um, <laughs> but I'm learning a lot of uh, anatomy and uh, quite a bit of programming, actually. Oh, uh, they have us take um a couple of years of statistics so i'm yeah. drowning when you graduated what was it like a year and a half ago yeah yeah a year and a half ago is it weird uh, being on the oh sorry go ahead yeah there's no just interrupting ahead. former students <laughs> is it As weird always, russell, nothing new here so yeah. russell's a former <laughs> student he was hazed by wendy phil and myself for two years of his life That's right um, you know, we loved him a lot. That's why we hazed him extra. We did such a good job instilling a, a a love of education that he's now in a PhD program. There you go. Which or, I'm pretty sure he was planning before he even came here for no, his master's degree. You, you need to take the credit for that. <laughs> I, I thought about it. I thought I've asked, uh, I think all three of you, yep. uh, a lot of questions about getting a doctorate. So absolutely. Yeah. Sure. With that, Russell, you're pretty fresh. I don't want to limit the conversation too much, but I do want to talk about people who have recently graduated, but also appealing to speech pathologists more broadly. No, no, you know, matter where you are, this 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 is about gaps, addressing gaps in education, practice, research, even though I can't help in that capacity too much. But maybe you will and Wendy will. But so what was it? that you thought was most surprising about transitioning out of the program and into your life being a speech pathologist? That's a really good question. I, I would say that the, the hardest part about that transition was um, just knowing how much responsibility was really on me. Um, I, I don't know, I learned all the theory, um, you know, in my undergrad and my graduate program. Uh, and then in my graduate program, I had some uh, a lot of um, you know hands-on learning, right? Uh, but uh, it wasn't until the training wheels were off, so to speak, that I I kind of realized the gravity of you know now I'm treating um, these kids. So kind of backing up, I I got my clinical fellowship year done um, in a school district. I was working with preschool through first probably the hardest uh, population for me to work with personally. And so I was just thinking about, you know, like how, you know, what if I make mistakes here? Uh, I'm going to ruin this kid's development forever. But it's all sorts of these thoughts uh, coming to me. So, yeah. Interesting. Let's come back to mistakes here in a second. I realized that I forgot to let Phil and Wendy introduce themselves. So Russell, you talked about yourself a bit. Uh, Wendy Chase here, who was, one of my bosses, 
simultaneously one of the most terrifying and one of the most lovable individuals you've ever met. <laughs> Russell, Amen. that's a pretty uh, constant impression of my presence. <laughs> what did your What does your son call you? The benevolent dictator. Benevolent dictator. <laughs> Bill, would you agree? <laughs> A little bit, yeah. <laughs> you're you're like, like I am more than happy to own that title. That's fine, you know, that's fine. But anyway, so Wendy, tell us a little bit about your background and what you do now. I had a clinical career, uh, mostly in healthcare settings for 20, almost 25 years. Uh, and then I moved into academia, first at the University of Connecticut, and now here at Rocky Mountain University oh. of Health Professions. But I also want to say that the comments that we make today represent <laughs> our comments and do not necessarily reflect the views of our employer. Okay, public service announcement over. <laughs> and then uh, the when she's going to say something crazy. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Why did we? Why did I come out to Rocky Mountain University? It was perfectly happy in Connecticut. A fabulous program. I loved so you're it. A clinic director at University yeah. of Connecticut. Yep. But I like building things. I like doing things my own way, which I believe most of my students and colleagues would agree is how I approach the world. Um, as in, <laughs> I think I have a good way, so let's all do it. Uh, and so I came out here when they were looking for faculty to start this program so that we could build a different kind of machine. Very cool. And you mentioned a lot of clinical practice. Yes. That was in what setting? Um, I would say the predominance was in a long-term acute care setting. We had uh, infants through end of life, uh, oh. and it was a vent hospital, uh, and it was a rehab hospital before it became an LTAC. I was alive during the time transition that, yeah, all the titles of things, yeah. designations changed. So it was a rehab hospital first, mm -hmm. um, and then an LTAC hospital, and I got really good at working with tricks and vents. Interesting. So uh, something else I want to add is that Wendy, from what I understand, you were giving sips of water and ice chips to people on ventilators before it was cool. Yep. We convinced the pulmonologists that they didn't even need us when a Ooh. patient was admitted to come down and say they could have chips and sips. Um, if the patient had a swallow and they could verify that a swallow had occurred uh, on saliva, then they just instituted the chips and sips. And then we came up next day and did the dysphagia valve. And it wasn't one of these, there's so many prereqs or anything like that, mm -hmm. because we knew that swallowing sips of water was going to do more to improve oral hygiene mm -hmm. than not. And so oral hygiene was really important and we worked on that. But the benefits of having sips and chips and continuing to practice swallowing and clear out some of that bacteria, way worth it. So something that you've said to me in the past that's really fascinating, and I have to tell you that I haven't followed up on this as much as I should have, but you've directed me to the near drowning literature <laughs> to get some things from, you know. We have to learn things from a lot of places I in agree. this field, yeah. hence the term medical SLP burger. Okay. Well, so with what was it that you thought, if we're talking about people who may or may not be aspirating, we don't know, but like, hey, give them sips and chips, chips and sips of water anyway, with a clean mouth. So, but what is it from the near drowning literature that you took away? Well, that that really um, spoke more to the capacity of the lungs to handle water and live. It's almost like we're made of water. Yeah, it's almost like we're made of water. <laughs> it's almost like there are millions of little tricule things in your lung tissue that we have do millions nothing. Of things in our lung tissue, right? <laughs> yeah. That millions. do nothing but but move water out of your lungs and disperse yeah. it into your tissue. I mean, it, it's set up to do that. And that. so if we're not, you know, leaving you underwater, that would be bad. <laughs> um, <laughs> the small amounts of water what that you? you get in chips and sips, uh -huh. your lungs are more than capable of dealing with. Now that ignores, you know, other things that New make wants. you high risk. And yeah, so it's it's not ever a black and white kind of thing, but yeah. Um, but the reduction in bacteria, oral flora and fauna, uh -huh. <laughs> um, from taking even a few sips each hour is tremendously more important than the fact that a couple of those germs may, may, go, may go the wrong way. It's, uh, I always use the analogy of the ponds in Florida where yeah. it's so flat, like it's black and there are gators in there, but you couldn't <laughs> see if there was a gator like a foot in front of you in the water. Okay, so 
let's ignore the nuances of what you were near drowning in. Well, because there's some issues. No, 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 no. I, you think I'm going somewhere that I'm not. This is where I'm going. So there's it's flat in Florida. So there's not streams that are flowing yeah. through the pond to get rid of the tannins and all the stuff. So the gator that's in front of you that's going to eat you, you can't see it. And so that's another thing. But you think of a, a mountain pond out here in Utah with water flowing through it. It's going to clean it. It's going to make it cleaner. So with the oral hygiene, excuse me, not the oral hygiene, the chips, it's almost like you're you're pushing water through the mouth to clean it out so yeah, it doesn't exactly. fester and turn into a Because we all know people with dry mouth don't swallow as frequently mm-hmm. on their saliva. Mm-hmm. Craziness. You need to keep doing that all day long. Yeah. Keep the countdown. So, yeah. I remember our zero stomia project. Yes. Yeah. You know I love my xerostomia. You love spit. I do. I'm a big <laughs> fan of saliva and all that it can do. All right. I'm going to start speaking and just spitting everywhere. <laughs> Bill, tell us about you. Uh, you're not in Kansas anymore, I right hear. I'm not in Kansas anymore. It's pretty apparent by all the mountains around the area. Yeah, ponds in Kansas dirty? Uh, uh, some of them can be. but Scum level we, is. We sure fished a lot of them. So Ooh, that explains um, a lot. But anyways. <laughs> Yeah, I came up through the ranks in, in Kansas, uh, mm-hmm. Fort Hayes State University, and then uh, spent my clinical career mainly in a, a major hospital in the Kansas City area. And it had it offered everything from the level one trauma to uh, skilled nursing, rehab, trach and vent, everything. Hmm. Um, and so I attributed a lot to what... Uh, my knowledge and skills are to this day to that those 10 years that I spent in Kansas City. Yeah. And uh, was able to return to academics or academia by uh, attending Wichita State University, getting my doctorate there. And uh, one day when I was teaching, I was back at Fort Hayes at the time, uh, the phone rang and it was uh, Rocky Mountain University. And they were talking about starting a new program. Uh, mentioning all the things that I felt like a medical SLP program should be offering and was perfectly in line with the things that I had done in my past clinical career. And I interviewed and long story short, here I am. And um, I'm kind of like Wendy here. I thought, you know, building the program kind of the way we wanted to build it Mm -hmm. and offer things that we wanted to offer. Um, I was really um, intrigued by that and it was it was a great decision. We mentioned benevolent dictator, but I've learned <laughs> I've learned a ton from Wendy Chase, and uh, I gotta be afraid. Uh, and I will say I'm a convert. Um, I'm now I'm now a chip and sip disciple myself. And um, gotta keep swallowing. One thing, Wendy, we talked one time about thick and liquids, and it's like yeah, but the thickener can cause a whole lot more problems than just regular water or ice chips. And so that was kind of a big factor. In, yeah. In lab now, we like to take the the uh, little capsules that the RTs use to flush the airways when yeah. they suction and, and, and talk about the fact that they just squirt those into the lungs. <laughs> How is it that that is, I mean, it's sterile when you I mean, begin with, you but aspirate, still. They can do that. But if you aspirate water, you'll die. That's yeah. Really it's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Easy. <laughs> we can put salt water in there all day long. Yeah. Wouldn't that give you like you got the wrong plenary... title? Oh, oh okay. <laughs> Yo, were you talking about normal saline? Yeah. No. Saline. Okay. Well, that's normal saline. So Phil, yes. Wendy. Yeah. I have had a remarkable relationship professionally with both of these individuals. We Russell, not, I mean we did not pay him to say that. So. But one of the things that's really <laughs> cool, a theme that comes up. So we've we've all worked on curriculum together, again, sitting at the feet of Wendy, learning lots of things. But we've all worked together and brought together many, many different perspectives. Um, and so with that, something that I think has been neat is, well, first of all, let me step back five seconds and say there's a theme here that all three of us have worked clinically first and then transitioned into Mm -hmm. academia for one reason or another. Mm -hmm. Um, And still, like at least in the clinic here, Phil covers a couple hospitals. Wendy, you work Mm -hmm. in the clinic here with clients. Um, I work clinically too. So we're still doing a lot of that. So trying to keep very practical and not just have our head in the clouds with, oh, this is the way it should be and that sort of thing. 
But so back to what I was going to say is uh, Wendy and Phil and I, we come from not only different parts of the country. I moved from Florida and from West Virginia originally. Phil moved from Kansas. Wendy moved from Connecticut. And you've been you know, many different places. But differences in perspectives, too, about a lot of different things. Um, so Phil and I co-taught a few dysphagia classes, three different mm -hmm. ones for a while. And you would always bring up like, I'm the old school, he's the new school, and we're bringing <laughs> together different things. But, you know, Wendy, you can answer this too. How do you think your perspective has changed in the midst of antagonism from Phil and I? Or Phil, antagonism from Wendy and I. And I can probably talk about, you know, how it changed my mind too. But I'm just curious because you have different perspectives. It's not where antagonism. Have... I would not use that word. Well, but I mean, in a positive way, you have people who are united in purpose. So you may be antagonistic mm -hmm. to a premise, yeah. but not to the purpose of best patient care. Right. I think that for me, that is exactly what we should be, is a group of people with very diverse ways of looking at a problem and or a situation or considering options. Um, and then it's only through that debate Okay. conversation, review, that we come out with what can be best practice. Nobody knows everything. That would be silly. And being able to have those conversations and those debates is nothing but an important model for students because that's what they need to do for the rest of their career. Okay. To stay current. It almost sounds like you're saying that education is not all about teaching people what to think, but also how to think, which may involve challenge. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Fair enough. I also think it, um, like, I used to, uh, coming from the old school, you know, just all about the swallow, the, the modified barium swallow, the fees, and just kind of so focused on the assessment part of it and, you know, what we're going to do about the findings that we that we come across um broadening the perspective here now i'm thinking more about social determinants of health ethics like the bigger picture bodily when you do recommend thickened liquids what does that do to systemically to hydration um and so uh, my mind has been broadened immensely and benefited immensely from working with you two um to to kind of keep that bigger picture in mind and i've learned a lot from you not just the sips and chips but you know, that's just one little thing, <laughs> you know, taking into it's account all, all the cultural variables and and everything else that needs to be considered uh, when you are dealing. You, know, you need to think of the patient as a person first and a patient second. And I didn't coin that. One of our recent interviews um, for a prospective student said that and I, I was very impressed by that. So, Russell, on the other side of this, what did it feel like being a student, knowing that your faculty were like arguing with each other? <laughs> I actually had no idea uh, because I think the way you delivered it. Friendly. Right? Uh, what's that? I said that. Friendly debate. Friendly debate. Friendly debate. Friendly debate. Friendly debate. Yeah, but I, it was mostly friendly. <laughs> I, it, I had no idea the way you delivered the material or, you know, organized uh, the program you know, I, I didn't bat an eye, but I, you know, I'm not surprised hearing it now that you guys all had different ideas and um, had friendly debates. I think that's really necessary. I, I Okay, so recently, uh, Utah just got rid of um, diversity, equity, and inclusion programs all across the state in mm -hmm. uh, public institutions. And that has been a really big deal to me. Um, I've come from a very diverse background. And um, I've learned growing up, you know, as, as an Asian guy in a white neighborhood, uh, how important it is to have disagreements um, and um, create something, you know, build something from that. Um, because we need, you know, the different perspectives. And I appreciate that you guys are talking about uh, your diverse experiences um, to create kind of this uh, uh, cohesive program that I, I went through. Nice. Yeah. That reminds me, it's that picture where there's an elephant in the room and, you know, Wendy's up there looking at the trunk and Bill, I don't, I don't even know where you're looking, but I'm like, <laughs> I'm, I'm scratching its ears and Russell, you're probably riding the thing. Yeah, but anyway, <laughs> anyway it's like, 
it's a trunk, you know, it's long and narrow. Yeah, it's yeah. a hydrate, muscular hydrostatin feels like these are some really cool muscular elephant legs. I don't know. What did I say? I was looking at the ears, but you know, different yeah. perspectives, rounding it out. That's yeah. But I think it's so cool that too, we don't, none of us, I think is reluctant to say, Hey, I read something. I don't know what to make of this. Yeah. This is new. Where does it fit into my schema? Is this something that and then we, you know, you say, what do you think about this? Or I send off an article and say, read this because yeah. I don't, I don't know what to do with it and where it goes. And then you can talk that out. I mean, yeah. it's constantly evolving. So it sounds like you're saying that admitting what you don't know and showing vulnerability is not necessarily something that's going to undermine. No, not know. at all. And that's why I think we drew Mount Stupid on your window one time on your office. It's <laughs> not a Kruger curve. We all want to get to the we all want to get to the to the height of yeah. Mount Stupid where we can see what we don't know. No, that's before that's, we fall off the other that's side. That's the the slope of stability. Oh, the I slope think. of for, stability. So for anyone yeah. listening, look at a Dunning Kruger Dunning graph. Kruger. When you know a little bit, you think you know a lot. That's the peak of Mount Stupid. And we've all been there. I'm probably still there. But anyway, then you fall off and you get hurt and you're like, this really stinks. And then you learn a little more and you stabilize. But it, it's it's an interesting concept. Totally recommend looking that but up. That, but that's, you know what? Here's yeah, yeah, This is an important concept. I don't want this opportunity to go by. Yeah. Our greatest gift to students is to constantly question themselves and complete yeah. self-assessment which leads to self-advocacy and lifelong learning. That is what I think we should be doing. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and really with our system, there's not as much accountability at the individual level. So you have to be like that. You're holding yourself accountable not mm -hmm. to do something that you aren't proficient-ish at. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be able to do that. Russell, you got um, you've got kind of limited time. How much time do you think you have? Uh, probably five minutes. And then five I got minutes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this is, this is going to be all about you for five minutes. I'm really curious and you don't have to speak to a particular no set. Pressure. So, yeah, no pressure. <laughs> Russell, not, not at all. But as in transitioning from being a graduate student, you know, getting ready to take the praxis where I'm sure there are things on that, that, that are scary. Like I was terrified of the peed stuff. Somehow I passed, but what, looking at that, looking at whether it's the praxis or whether it's getting a CS supervisor that's who supports you, what types of things do you think are essential for recent graduates going out? And even maybe those who are mentoring recent graduates, like so many of our colleagues. Yeah, um, I think I can think of two things off the top of my head. The first thing is um, in uh, preparing uh, to graduate, right? So in, in your master's program or bachelor's, um, I think simulations were probably the, the best things that helped me prepare for um, being a little more independent. So uh, when we did the MBSS simulations in your classes, your dysphagia classes, um, we're going to get rest in trouble. <laughs> uh, but but I learned I learned the theory with you know looking at the actual images, endoscopy simulations, bedside manner, trach vents, right, supervised um, yeah. clinicals. And I think the important thing, the second thing that I'm going to mention is uh, adequate mentorship. I think we need to have, um, you know, really good mentors out there. I'm not just talking about like your clinical supervisors, but also, um, you know, just people you can ask questions about. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I remember asking you three about a doctorate program and, you know, what about this? You know, what about the money? Is it going to be hard or uh, how long did it take uh, for Wendy, it's taking, you know, 13,000 years, but <laughs> I didn't know you were that Okay, old. it's only five. I'm at the end of year oh, five. I mean, that's particular I think she's making great progress. I think the problem is just that I started when most of my brain cells are dying. And that's. I'll race, race you to the finish line. Yeah. And when you pull <laughs> two other jobs. So, so, so I do want to go back real fast about the thing on simulation. So I'm sorry, finish what you were saying about mentorship, but I, I don't want to, something I don't want to forget. Yeah, no, no worries. Uh, I, I really do think that that's key. I've had bad experiences with clinical mentorship. Um, when I was in my CFY, um, the other SLP was also overwhelmed with our large caseload. And so that I felt was really good for me, for my growth, um, because then I, I could watch how she was doing things and kind of apply it in my own practice. Yes. So yeah, mentorship. Yeah. 
Very cool. And learning from, you know, observing, learning from how people handle things. So with the simulations, you mentioned that, and I know you're referring to a lot of things in graduate school, but not everybody has the same opportunity in graduate school. So ideas for people who can learn from like a similar way of learning, either as they're finishing up graduate school with external resources after they graduate with, I don't know, what's what's there to help people get more involved in case-based learning, top-down simulation, different sort of things like that, integrated learning. Like what what helps with simulations? Well, like, so if you didn't have that experience, do you, are there some resources that you can, that you uh, would mm. put people toward or just ideas? Yeah, I think it's, it's just, unfortunately, I think it's a lot of knowing the right people, right? Okay. Uh, having a, a good enough network. So even if it's your peers um, that you're hearing from, I think those are the, the best resources. Uh, podcasts like these, you know, where you can go on on YouTube or, you know, listen on Spotify and just hear people's experiences. Mm -hmm. um, that has been a tremendous help for me as well. Yeah. What about one thing that really comes to mind? And for the record, I just totally put Russell on the spot. There was no prep for that whatsoever. He's like, <laughs> he's like, I got to go. I got to go. And so there's so many things <laughs> happening, but like case studies. So you're talking about simulations. And so within simulations, you get this whole case history. You get a patient, like a real thing that's going on. And it's not just in a book. This is what reduced base of tongue retraction looks like. But it forces you to integrate a lot of different things. I mean, I've heard of and have had success myself just from discussing cases with people and them asking questions about the cases maybe that I wouldn't have thought of. Like, okay, like this is what I want to tell you. This is what I think is important. They're like, well, what do you think about this too? I don't know, anything like that. And really, this is open to whoever. You know, my question, Russell, is would you have known you missed simulations if you hadn't had them? Would you have recognized that that could have been beneficial if you hadn't had it? Yeah, I think that simulations are going to come, uh, you know, regardless of whether you had them in grad school or not. But um, I was I'm I'm seeing kind of the differences between uh, a lot of students that I've talked to here um and this you know like my cohort right people who haven't had these same simulations they'll go out into uh clinical settings and it seems like you know they they learn on the job and they make far more mistakes i think that is detrimental to your confidence as a clinician whereas here uh you know simulations provide kind of a um a safe place to make mistakes um yeah yeah so you're going to respect us for making you fail a lot. I hope so. I didn't say that, but <laughs> yeah. I mean, no, I, I think it was, I think it was a really good growth opportunity, right? I, yeah. Mistakes are, are meant to help us learn and grow and become better clinicians, better exactly. researchers. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so, well, I think so along with that, with the simulations, the debrief that comes yeah. right after a oh, lot yeah. of simulations are where even maybe more significant learning takes place. Yeah, that's a really good. Oh, so I think there's a great application. Right this one? I think I think you made a great point. <laughs> so if you think of people right now who are recent graduates going into a CFY or people who are working in the field and they're going to mentor, you know, a younger clinician or CFY or whatever, it's not just talking about cases. It's not just seeing people together, but like maybe before you see someone, let's talk about what could happen. And then let's go see this patient together let's talk about it afterward. You know, that sort of thing too, that you're getting kind of the before the hypothesis mm -hmm. making, the predicting, and then you're getting the bedside manner and all of these other things during. And then afterward, it's like, well, I know I didn't do that perfectly. So let's talk about what I would do differently. Let's talk about what works really well. I think that is a phenomenal tool for anybody. I mean, you don't have to be a CF. I could use that a lot, Phil. But you know. then uh, I, I would add that let's go back in there and do it again after we've talked about it. The patient might not appreciate getting billed twice. Well, but... it's a mannequin or <laughs> if you're Tim's in practice, you're still in the I'm simulation. I'm still in the simulation. Simulation lab. No. So I will I'll have to run, but I just want to say thanks so much for letting me out hang out with you guys. I really appreciated your mentorship and uh yeah, I I I'm glad I got to see you guys again. It's been so long. So yeah, man. Really nice good to, to see you, you Russell. Too. Appreciate it. Thanks, Russell. Right. Let's take care. One other thing to bring up with that is I think 
in each one of our positions, no matter where we are, if you're a student, if you're a new grad, if you've been practicing for 1800 years, like Wendy, according to Russell, at least, wait, 1300 years, you've been doing your PhD. Maybe 13,000. I'm, I'm not you sure. You practiced for 30 years before that. So 1330 what? years. Ex to, to exactly. 1325. I'm, uh, yeah, we're going to, I'm not counting five more years than I have to. Okay. That's fair. That's fair. So no matter where you are, I mean, consider what you bring to the table. One of the things that I think with new graduates is you bring so much enthusiasm and you bring new knowledge, that, oh, hopefully new knowledge, new literature, new things from, from school. And maybe the application of those things is harder because you don't have the overall gestalt, the overall form of what things look like. But that's where your mentorship helps a lot. But you can help them so much with this new information. So anyway, just kind of a thought with that. Anything you want to add to it before keep moving on? I mean, I just think that what we've been kind of talking about here lends itself to kind of this competency-based education mm -hmm. model, mm -hmm. uh, which Wendy is highly involved with since that's that is much a big part of her competency. dissertation um, and kind of like the competency-based education versus kind of how we've kind of always done things. Mm -hmm. um, and then helping students to have that competency and that con then helping that confidence level with mm -hmm. them. Um, but, but it's a big, it's a big job. It's uh, when you could talk a lot more about it than, than I'm able to right now, but I, I see that it's just, I used to think, why aren't we giving our students the tools to hit the ground running mm -hmm. when they graduate? Because in my practice at the hospital, I'm doing endoscopy. We're doing these, we're doing all these, what what at, back then and maybe still now a lot of them were considered like advanced types of um, you know procedures and things in the field um, tracheoesophageal voice prosthesis and my perception was that uh, I don't know if the graduate programs then or even now if we're giving the students the tools to go out and and hit the ground running with some of those more advanced things even though those those are things that they're going to find when they get out there so uh, but what I've come to learn is. I don't know that you can possibly give them everything they need right. in the graduate program to hit the ground running, but you can give them a nice foundation to where they can continue to cross train and have their competencies checked off when they get there. Uh, and I don't, Wendy might have some things what? to add about that. But. I mean, well, that's the thing. Our hands are tied we, with our resources, I think, and what yeah. we can offer within five or six semesters. But so making the best use of that time, and I think a lot of that is a uh, training people to be reflective, like you were saying, and to be mm -hmm. very interested in, in continuous learners for the rest of their lives, because there's no way, no way, in my opinion, that you yeah, can get it all five and, that, and long yeah. before we had this massive explosion of our scope of practice <laughs> yeah. um, to include all these things, we were still in a situation with a master's degree that we had to choose what to teach in the program, mm -hmm. knowing that not too many years down the road, it was going to be a lot of that would be obsolete. So I think yeah. that just becomes more and more and more clear every day yeah. in graduate education. And the only way, as far as I'm concerned anyway, to combat that is to teach students how to reflect, mm -hmm. assess their own competency, and find the resources because they know how to process through things. Mm -hmm. And so knowledge is important. Foundational knowledge is important, mm -hmm. but I don't think it's more important than practice with clinical skills, demonstration of abilities, and demonstration of the ability to integrate information, search out resources, add those to the framework, yeah. and solve a problem. And interprofessional Yeah, and all that comes in. Do it under stress. Do it with disruption. Do it by talking to people in other yeah. professions, et cetera. We always talked about knowing your resources. And, and, you know, when people in my, at least when I hear the word resources, I'm oh, books, articles, that sort of thing. But you really emphasize the idea of resources or people. Mm -hmm. So learning mm -hmm. from other colleagues, lots of that. Excellent point, Wendy. Excellent point. What about if people find themselves, they are trying to be a change agent for good in their mind, but maybe in more of a stale environment where people are uh, maybe resistant to that because as much as we should be growth, what is the word? Growth mindset, having a little bit of anomia, have a growth <laughs> mindset. 
it, it's also hard to do. And especially, you know, if someone's been practicing for a long time, it might be hard to get them to do that. Or a new student, maybe they feel very vulnerable. And so they don't want to admit that. So how do we facilitate that without putting people on edge that we're saying, I know more than you, you should listen to me. It's a really good question. And you're right. Students struggle with that a lot. Um, it's a very common source of ethical dilemma for a student to go out and have learned one thing in a course and yeah. see a different thing in practice. But I think that the the student or the new professional needs to recognize evidence-based practice has three different sides to it. Well, four, depending on which model you're looking at these days. But um, And one of them is clinical experience. So you have to re reflect respect for that clinician in the field's sure. clinical experience and, and investigate how they came to that. And right. when you listen, you then get to share and you can say, oh, OK, so here's how we learn it. And, and now you have a conversation instead of a confrontation. I have conversation mm -hmm. instead of a confrontation. I like it. I like it a whole lot. Let's see here. There are a million, probably not exaggerating at all, a million things that we could talk about in this vein to try to trim a little bit on the time and also maybe try to lighten it a little bit. Y'all ever made a mistake as a clinician? So we're talking about like, <laughs> I don't think so I ever have. No, no I, Phil's perfect. I can't, I don't think you've ever made one, Phil. But with, with this, so we're talking about like, okay, growth, learning more. So if you pretend like you've got it all right and know it all, that's an unrealistic expectation and it's frankly wrong and you're not going to get anywhere. At least that's my opinion. I feel very strongly about that. I know I've like, made a lot of mistakes, probably more than most people. <laughs> but... I wouldn't say that. I would say that the leaps we see in our own evolution and yeah. thinking are entirely based on accepting the vulnerability of being in a position to fail and then dealing with the failure. Yeah. Um, coming back, I mean... I've been failing since graduate school. Regular <laughs> so, so tell me more. I want to know how you <laughs> failed. <laughs> like, benevolent okay. dictator. How have you failed? Okay. So at North Hold on. Let me call Jen Chapin on here. <laughs> back, <laughs> back in the day, back in the day um, at Northwestern University, where I did my graduate degree, right? They had this thing called the LISP Award, L-I-S-P, but it was a big set oh, below made goodness. of LISP. And they would award it to students who were really, really incapable in a clinical situation. Oh dear. It's almost <laughs> so, amazing. Yeah. So we we would, you know, you would laugh about it. You had to learn to embrace those yeah. uh, those vulnerable moments. Um and I earned it just so you know. So starting right there in graduate school, mm -hmm. uh, I taught one small child to pronounce his name as Jeffrey instead of Jeffrey because I didn't bother to let him know that his F for TH substitution <laughs> didn't apply to his actual name. Um, and you should probably hang on to that F there. And and another individual who I was uh, working with who was severely hearing impaired and said that he needed to call his office to check with his secretary about a schedule at the end of our session. And I said, yeah, well, there's the phone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was the start of a long and in. glorious career of, making lots of, of messing up. Yeah. I think um, one that I will certainly never forget is the client who had been recently diagnosed with acute care diabetes, acute onset diabetes because of the acute care situation. And uh, that hadn't really gotten into the chart quite yet on the problem list. Uh, and I didn't bother to check with the nurses before I did my swallow of out. Yeah. But so I gave that client some orange juice as part of the uh, assessment. Uh, that didn't go well. Yeah. Well, I am taking notes because I know <laughs> some of your former colleagues and students. And Who would I'm like gonna, to know? Yeah, I'm going to sell dirt. And I, <laughs> hey, whatever works. If you could turn some of that money into a scholarship fund for our students, I'd oh, love it. Yeah, <laughs> that would be great. Yeah. So Wendy Chase yeah. scholarship for students Seriously. who can't do clinic good. Yeah. Something like that. Something like that. Something like that. Bill, you got any mistakes? Oh, I might have made one or two. The one that comes to mind, I was in my first year in the hospital setting, and this was the year after I had done my CFY, and I went through the public school for my CFY, and um, I knew I wanted to go to the hospital. So once I got that, I I went there. But long story short, I was uh, I was to do a modified barium swallow study and review the chart and everything, get down there, the patient's there. And it's a frail elderly 
lady who was breathing very heavily and the I'll never forget the radiologist was ready to go and I was standing there with ready to go and he and the radiologist looks at me and goes I don't think we should do this because the it was very frail and breathing fast and um it just didn't look like she was ready to handle it and then mm-hmm. uh you know after a minute or two the the patient started to breathe in a little more relaxed and looked a little better and so uh, we both agreed, well, let's go ahead. And and back then, instead of starting with a thin liquid, uh, I thought, well, maybe pudding's safer. And so um, I introduced... Thank you for uh, coming beyond that. Thank you. Yeah, I'm beyond that now. But uh, I introduced a spoonful of pudding. Wasn't that big, but um, the, the patient was so frail that um, the swallow, it, like it went over the, the back of the tongue, but it lodged right inside the glottis. Ooh. She did not have the strength to... Oh pull it in or push it out and before we know it um, she's turning white and like right about that time the code blue is called and everybody comes flying into the room and um i went back into the corner like <laughs> like oh my god what's happening here um now i know better to kind of help out with the situation but i think but, too we talked about this situation yeah. this is why we need to help students and new professionals do a better job assessing the entirety yeah. of the situation and not just be focused on that one. I would expand piece. that well beyond students and new professionals yeah. because there are a lot of ways. That and that's, do that's that. the crux of medical SLP. It doesn't matter where that patient is, where that mm-hmm. client is. Be in the public school system, you have a responsibility as a professional to take into account yeah. all the factors that may yeah. impact it. You may, you don't, you're not the expert in those things. But you need to understand how they can impact your treatment plan. All right. But wait, I have to tell a story. Can I tell the end of the story? Yes, go ahead. Patient Um, lives. (laughs) Yeah. So the patient lives. They're looking at the patient. (laughs) Uh, But they were looking around. They couldn't find the medical chart. Back then, it was the the physical medical chart. And on the front of the chart, guess what letters were there? DNR. DNR. Oh, Phil. Had that chart have been there where they would have could have found it. Mm-hmm. I hate to think what might have happened in that situation. Wow. I almost quit that day, the field entirely. I had a very good director at that time, and we had a nice chat for about an hour. And debriefing. Uh, so he kind of yeah, he debriefed and kind of helped me get back on track with, mm-hmm. with thinking through that. Um, and I share that story in class in the classes with with my students mm-hmm. today because. Like I'm embarrassed about it, but but it's also something that you know they they could probably learn from from that story from yeah. my experience. If you're not saying it's okay, you're saying that this is going to happen. You're going to make mistakes, and so this is what you can do. Learn from me, and right. then you're making the best out of it. But also, I think a huge takeaway from that is to know your support system. Right. So your director was very supportive. So yeah. I mean, you need that's a really good point. Yeah, for sure, Wendy. I want to hear your okay. Story. So. This is a good one. Okay. So this was probably halfway through my clinical career. Fees was a new thing. So I'd gone off and gotten all my training and done my thing. And mm-hmm. I was training my staff. And mm-hmm. um, so we we had a pretty active and effective fees program. We used it a ton on the vent weaning unit mm-hmm. um, because we wanted to see secretions. We needed to see swelling. There were so many yeah. concerns with soft tissue that it, and those patients are not exactly as uh, robust and movable as some of the patients in the other floors. And so we use fees a lot. Um, well, when I was starting fees, I hadn't learned yet that you should not lock up all your muscles standing at the bedside. Mm, and this was a patient for whom we were um watching a lot of we we needed the time factor which you can do with fees right so based on the case so i'm standing there with the scope and we're doing our thing and there's an aide there helping to you know give the food substances and so on um and i said you know what would you run over and get the pulmonologist because i think they're going to want to see what's happening here with this airway it was it was just a really narrow airway i knew they were thinking about decannulating this guy Hmm. And um, so the pulmonologist comes over, (laughs) luckily, because right about then, I wasn't going to stay standing. Hmm. You lock your knees? Well, no, I I was so locked up, I was getting lightheaded and dizzy, and the blackness was coming. And it was like, okay, so I'm standing here with this tube in this individual's nose. 
Yeah. I don't need anybody to freak out, but I need to stop holding the scope right now. Yeah. So luckily, the pulmonologist was there. I said to the doctor, I said, would you mind just holding on to this scope for a minute? I'll be right back. <laughs> He's like, okay, I'll go down and look inside the layers. I said, okay. <laughs> and I went out into the hallway and, you know, yeah. took, a, took a breath and a moment. And then I came back and we finished the test. But it was like, you have to accept that you're yeah. human. Yeah. <laughs> and I learned quickly to adopt a more relaxed stance at the bedside. Mm -hmm. Could you please transfer that to like other things and be a little bit more relaxed and less intense, Wendy? Yeah. <laughs> no. No. I no. forget like people can't when it see comes to the teaching. look that I'm giving Wendy as I say that. <laughs> the, no. When it comes to teaching, intensity is, uh, uh, what do I want to say, is is my theme, I guess. Yeah, it's so meaningful to me, and I'm, and I know that it comes across so intimidating. Well, but it's it's such a passion that we do this. It is right. We're very, with these we're students. Very, I'd like to add that she and I co-teach quite a few classes. Mm -hmm. so I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm I'm the counterbalance on yeah. that. Yeah, right. Yeah, and that's what I need. That and that that's not why I think we work really well together because right. between us we can represent a whole lot of perspectives yeah. um, and methods. So, so you sure. found that multiple like co-teaching. Yeah. That's that's very good. Yeah, there's so many yeah. benefits yeah. to that. Yeah, I've learned yeah. a lot from co-teaching with, with Phil, Dr. Septum. Well, we do need to wrap up. Wouldn't be fair if I didn't throw out a mistake. So I'll be quick with this though. So Phil, you covered clinical. When do you also covered clinical? But there was what was the first one you told about? Oh clinical. yeah, the the client who couldn't hear who oh like, yeah so like the, the kind telephone. of the, the pragmatic the communication with client and then clinical things yeah and so we've talked about collaborating with your colleagues and a lot of that sort of thing too so i'm going to put out one regarding communication um sometimes for many reasons we all have a lot of demands and you get frustrated for whatever reasons and it's hard to talk sometimes directly with the person because you're intimidated, you say they're busy, I don't want to blah, blah, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But um, I mean, just as a theme, that's a, I mean, that's a huge thing for me is kind of standing up straight and just going in and chatting with people about that I have differences with or differences in opinion about something. Uh, I mean, we're not supposed to all agree on everything and we're not supposed to all get along all of the time. And so I think that is incredibly important as you go out there is just getting away with the idea that even your your communication or your interprofessional or your collegial relationships are going to be perfect so not making that your expectation but having the expectation that like you know giving people the benefit of the doubt and also willing to be direct what was the thing that we had here is clear as kind clear as kind is that's that, a brain around brown? thing we can think yeah. um is Chris, Kristen Ipson yeah, one of our clinical faculty yeah for bringing that mantra to us and we live by it. But I think respect is critical. Yeah. And again, what do we need to teach students? We need to teach students that uncomfortable conversations is where you grow. Yeah. Well, and it might help to make something later a lot less uncomfortable mm -hmm. too. I mean, there's a lot to it. Yep. It's that is as much a competency outcome in graduate school mm -hmm. as anything else. How do you approach a difficult conversation? Yeah. Well, is there any, are there any parting words that you'd like to leave them with? It's been a really, I think, a really well-rounded discussion that you can integrate in a lot It's of been an interesting discussion, Tim. I think, I think we could probably talk about our mistakes for hours on well, end. Well, I would yeah. like to hear some of the, if you have replies, I would like to hear other, yeah. other mistakes. Other mistakes? Other mistakes. Yeah. Okay. We need well, a forum. Yeah. Well, actually, that's, so... For those who are listening, one of the things I'm considering doing is I'm kind of making like a forum for episodes that you can put follow up questions and that either guests on the podcast who are willing can record like a five minute answer response or go on there and just write some stuff back. So that may be in the works if there's enough interest in it. I think that would be super cool. It makes us more of a dialogue and a conversation than Tim and his friends are talking at you. So anyway, <laughs> I know we're ready to wrap up, but yeah. I would like... Wendy Chase to talk about medical, medical SLP. Medical SLP. Well, of medical SLP. So no, I think we have that time. Statement. That's okay. I mean, medical, if you have time, if you it could be a whole nother episode. It but. could. Medical speech language pathology is a philosophy, not a location. That's it. Think about it. It's a way you approach things. It is not where you are practicing. It is how you are practicing. The end. And now I have another meeting, so we really do have to wrap. Okay, up. Phil. 
No, that's okay. That's you will pass. So thank you everybody for listening. I do want to throw out a very quick plug. Y'all are still hiring a PhD, right? Yes. Okay. So if you want to work with some really cool people yes. in a really cool setting with cool equipment, you should go on rm.edu. We have requirements in August. We need new people. Yeah. rm.edu. Look for that position. And y'all are still accepting uh, students, right? Yeah. We um, we roll admissions along until, okay. uh, what, June 1? Something mm-hmm. like yeah. that. So really phenomenal program, especially if you're looking for people who want to work with this medical model mindset and get endoscopy training and a lot of other things like that that are really cool. So help to spread the word. Great place to learn. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Ms. Soon-to-be Dr. Wendy Chase, Dr. Phil Sectum, Russell, soon-to-be Dr. De Jesus, and you can call me whatever you want, but have a great rest of your day and see you next Tuesday. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Tim. So today we had three individuals from very different backgrounds, but also with a lot of similarities. A recent graduate who is now a PhD student, a clinical director who's also a director of clinical education, and an associate professor who are all from different places, but who came together to either work or study within the same Masters of Speech Language Pathology program. So I hope that no matter where you're living, working, studying, or whatever it is you're doing, that you've gained something from their conversation that you can take forward with you to benefit your life and your career and to improve dysphagia intervention within your own unique sphere of influence. And while it's not required, there are ways that you can help to keep this podcast going for next to nothing at swallowthegap.com slash support. And of course, it's always free just to tell people about us. Share a link on social media, whatever works for you. Have a wonderful week and know that together we are making a difference.